Good morning. This is Lori Schmidt, the Wolf Curator at the International Wolf Center, and we'd like to welcome you to our first uh, Friday update uh, during this period of time when the center is not available. We know that a lot of people uh, come to see our captive wolves, and so we uh, wanted to start uh, this kind of uh, period of transition uh, while the center is not allowing visitors, um, we wanted to give you a chance to be able to keep up with the pack and be able to ask questions to the wolf care staff. There's no real structure in this uh, process. If you joined us early, uh, I was panning back and forth between our, our cameras. Uh, Grizzer just had breakfast. Uh, standard routine for Grizzer is to come in from the pack holding area. Um, he he, he usually sleeps in the transition area, which is kind of this uh, um, area that's uh, got a roof line over here. That's where he sleeps. It's all protected. There's no ice, snow, got a good bed of hay. Um, he sleeps in there. He comes into this transition or sort of through the transition area into the pack holding area um, and actually comes in the vestibule. Um, and that's uh, where I was trying to pan the camera down uh, to be able to see the vestibule where he comes in to eat. Uh, we do try to feed him in the vestibule so that we have uh, the ability um, to, uh, you know, make sure that he has like a positive conditioning uh, to the uh, the pack holding area because it does go directly into the wolf care center. So the heated building, which is where we always want him to be comfortable. Um, we kind of do a positive association that his morning breakfast is there, um, the vestibule that leads right into the building. So he always has a kind of a good memory of that pl place and that space. If we need to, um, you know, later on in his life, um, deal with uh, uh, transitioning into an indoor space. So um, at this time, like I said, I, I um, am opening up to any questions that you have about the exhibit. I'll kind of talk a little bit about uh, what's going on. Um, there was uh, the question that came in um, do you, about uh, if we have general interactive cameras that viewers can control and move to look around the pens. Uh, we do not, and uh, we uh, let me kind of explain why uh, we have uh, been working on kind of a new process for our surveillance cameras. Uh, they're very critical to us, uh, obviously, here in management. So we have been building um, that. In addition to that, we have just entered a relationship with Explore.org, who is going to uh, sponsor two, if not more, of our webcams, uh, and they will actually have. Uh, someone who is kind of responsible, and I'm not sure how it's going to be structured yet, but who will try to monitor wolf activity and move cameras around for us. Uh, obviously, we have a lot of viewers, and so to have uh, uh, control of the cameras in um, anyone's hands um, can be overwhelming um, for, uh, you know, probably people watching. And um, uh, we had an experience with the uh, Bear Center telling us that, uh, uh, there were times when, you know, they had volunteers that would move the cameras and somebody would uh, focus in on a chickadee and then kind of go away and do something else. And next thing you know, um, the exam, the camera is just focused on, you know, two square inches and left like that for a while. So um, obviously uh, that would be challenging. And uh, we do need to control the cameras from the standpoint of things that we need to watch because our webcams are also our surveillance cameras. So I think we will uh, come up with uh, a better plan once explore.org org, um, gets everything set up and and it's not really their delay it's our delay uh, you might notice we still have winter and so winter is one of those things that is uh, continually uh, becoming an issue for us and so uh, we uh, hope uh, it is 10 degrees right now so we are not hoping real well but uh, we're hoping to get rid of some snow and once that snow goes um, there'll be a new uh, webcam line installed on this wall and that's going to feature what we consider to be kind of the north side of the pen fence uh, line in the exhibit and then um, uh, we'll also feature the back of the den site so that's kind of what we're hoping to do and so like I say Grizzard does his morning Grizzard gets his morning routine wolf care staff will pick up scat you'll notice he did a little raise like not really raised like urination, but more of a standing urination here. His urine is a little bit yellow. Um, dehydration is kind of one of those issues that we deal with in the cold. Uh, but uh, overall, he's uh, doing pretty well. I believe he ate all his breakfast. And one of the questions someone had was, how much do the wolves eat? 
Well, Grizzer is on a daily diet. Uh, we try to get him three pounds of meat a day. And so we vary it between beef and bone dust. Um, he did take uh, pork again yesterday. He hadn't been taking pork because I think he was a little sensitive on um, an abscess tooth that we've been dealing with in the last couple of months. So he did eat pork again uh, yesterday. So that was a really good sign uh, for us that he's um, kind of teeth feeling good on the men. So uh, we do um, have obviously concerns. And um, uh, let me just back up. I've got some questions coming in. Should we have audio yet? Um, Grizzers Enclosure does not have audio. Um, the camera, uh, the, uh, um, the um, 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 audio uh, mic is hanging there, but we have not run the line yet. So um, anyways, uh, so I'm, I'm just kind of... Uh, of trying to field questions, so it's getting a little distracting here. So Grizzer is uh, going to be 16 on May 5th. He actually is the oldest wolf that we've uh, managed here. So the webinar, again, did start at 9. Um, it's not been going on very long. I had it, um, um, I had basically the camera on for a while uh, so people could watch. Uh, so it did start live at 9, so you didn't miss anything. Uh, other questions that are coming in, what are the holes in the ground? And so... Uh, the holes in the ground, basically, there's a couple of obviously things that are um, uh, basically we have a den site here. If you're referencing this big area, that is a concrete and rock den site that uh, obviously he doesn't crawl into right now because he sleeps in this transition area here. But that's pretty much uh, where you'll see all of our enclosures have den sites, uh, the exhibit pack. Um, which uh, does have audio. And so just, um, Elizabeth, I, you know, I got a uh, message from you that you were not getting audio. Like I said, Grizzer's enclosure, we just haven't finished it. It's basically a cable that's waiting for ground to thaw for us to uh, be able to finish that. But you should be he hearing now the exhibit pack. Basically what you're seeing in the exhibit pack is Axel posturing with a T2 tail. He's got bolts uh, in the medical pen. Bolsa goes in there, he gets a little power in there because he can face off to Axel and not have to worry about anyone coming behind him. Oh, Denali was in there too. Uh, so sometimes Axel holds them captive in the medical pen. Axel's just an excited little uh, three-year-old. Um, he's got a lot of energy. He's got a lot of, I want to be you know, social. I want to be greeting. I want to be running around. I want to be licking you in the face. And sometimes a bit much for even his own brother. Uh, but um, we are seeing some hormonal uh, kind of changes here where the pack is uh, definitely um, getting a little bit more social. This is the time of year when prolactin hormone increases. Usually around April, we start to see the happy hormones and where everybody's a love fest and everybody's kind of getting along pretty well. So um, there's a couple of questions here that I want to be um, addressed. Uh, firstly, Donna asked, um, did I see Tina there? Yes, Tina is here. She has a little fear avoidance behavior going on right now. Um, during a power outage recently, we have some backup battery things in my dog, Tina, who helped uh, care for the 2016 pups, Axel and Grayson. She was a surrogate uh, canine mom. And uh, just about maybe, I don't know, three months ago, a power outage um, set off the battery backups. And so she got a little traumatized and she is sitting in the yard saying, this place is horrible. I want to go home. It's too noisy. Um, so we're dealing with a little canine psychosis in Tina. Uh, she is uh, going to be 15 in July. So she is definitely um, an older dog who I'm surprised she even heard it. She's kind of going deaf, uh, but uh, it, it caused her some angst. So she is socialized to the wolves. Uh, they know her. Um, it is always important for us to have a dog around who the wolves are familiar with because dogs normally are uh, tolerant of the human dimension and usually remain calm with humans around, and that helps calm the wolves. Um, uh, I don't think the wolves know that Tina has a psychotic episode here uh, uh, with the uh, lab, so they're um, not seeing her angst in the lab. Obviously, that's going to be a challenge if we have a wolf pups around and Tina's showing anxiety, the wolf pups will pick up on that. So, so I've got to do a little oh, my own uh, work with my, um, with my dog um, to make her feel a little bit comfortable. And like I said, Grizzer does have the other hole. I think that's what you're referencing is the east side, Dan. We just have so much snow here. 
Um, and a grizzard doesn't sleep in these dens. Um, grizzard actually sleeps, I could say, in this transition area. So the cameras are different. Um, the east side, uh, this is the east side retirement. It is a stationary camera. I do not have pan, tilt, zoom. I only have the pan, tilt, zoom in the pack holding area where the pups will be. Um, so we'll be able to zoom in on them. I have a pan, tilt, zoom in the yard, also where the pups will be. The pups will be coming out of the pack holding area, crossing the yard, and then going into the building um, over on this right side here. So they'll be up against the fence, so they'll see the adults, and then they'll come through this little gate, and they'll go this back door to go into the building uh, to be able to see uh, again, the public uh, programs, those will not start until June 5th. And then um, obviously the exhibit pack, uh, which is here, um, um, has pan, tilt, zoom, and that's our main webcam. So if you are using the q and I see that I have a question um, here, where are the wolves rescued from? Um, these wolves were not rescued. These wolves are all born in captivity. Um, they were brought here during what we call the neonate stage at a very young age to be able to reduce their fear avoidance. Uh, we find with wolves, uh, they have a problem with tolerances of humans um, if they are uh, older than about 21 days of age. They actually um, start fear avoidance very, very young. And so that makes it challenging in captivity. So all of our wolves are uh, bottle fed. Um, they are conditioned to this exhibit. They are adopted from other facilities. We are not a breeding facility. If you'd like uh, more information about that, we have a webinar actually on uh, Wednesday, the 25th, uh, the Life and Luna, uh, um, Life and Legacy of Luna, one of our captive wolves who has uh, recently um, was euthanized because of cancer. Uh, we can address that even in more detail. So, uh, but basically everybody here is uh, captive born, they were brought here at a young age. This is Bolts we're looking at. His birthday webinar was just on Tuesday. He is an eight-year-old Minnesota subspecies of the gray wolf. The average lifespan in the wild, uh, that's a question that came in, probably eight. Um, if you're lucky, maybe in Yellowstone, um, they may have had some um, wolves to be uh, older, closer to 12. Uh, here in Minnesota, again, life is, is, is a little bit harsher. Uh, we're likely to see, again, maybe eight or 10 um, as being an old wolf. In captivity, we do know of a wolf uh, that uh, was about 21 years of age uh, when she passed. Actually, it was Shadow and Malik's mother, if you are familiar with our organization. Shadow and Malik were Arctic subspecies we had here in the year 2000, and uh, their mother was a, a, had a long life. Our oldest wolf that we ever had here is Grizzer, who's about to be 16. Um, I'd say most captive facilities start to see decline around that 12 to 14 um, age structure. Another question that came in, will we live stream this to YouTube later? That's my plan, although Zoom um, um, is uh, uh, challenging um, a little bit because Zoom is now kind of the go-to software for a lot of people that are uh, working from home. Um, Boltz's webinar was archived and the cloud download from Boltz's webinar was processing from Tuesday night at 6.30 until I just got it, I think last night around nine o'clock. And so we'll see how long it takes uh, Zoom to process this. But uh, yes, I am recording to the cloud and I hope to uh, have it. But if not, I am producing a YouTube later today. Um, I, I produce YouTube uh, segments uh, on a regular basis. And so uh, you'll be able to see some information um, there as well. So, uh, there is a question, when are you getting the pups and can my family come to visit and interact with them? Uh, well, the pups will typically be born the late, late April uh, because of their health. Um, we do not allow um, them to be on public display until at least June 5th. That's when they get vaccinated um, uh, for their own protection. We do not allow uh, people to interact with the pups. Obviously, um, raising a wolves is not like raising with dogs. Uh, we are very concerned about negative conditioning. Uh, people can uh, do a behind the scenes and observe the pups, but uh, we do not have uh, interactive sessions with our pups here. Um, we have such a high uh, amount of volume of people that come to our facility, such a, 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 an interesting dynamic. Uh, again, we manage a pack of wolves. 
um, that are, uh, once the pups come into the pack, they're managed as a social group. So our big focus is socializing with the wolf care pups so that they have someone they trust for their entire lives. So when we get to a wolf like Grizzer, who's 16 years of age and needs hand on, hands on care, that we have someone there who can um, make that end of life decisions for them and end of life care for them uh, the best that we can possibly do. And so, so our big focus is one, first, that the wolves are socialized to the staff who care for them throughout their lives. Two, that they have a good social interaction with the pack who is going to adopt them. And usually that happens around uh, maybe early August, uh, before the prolactin hormone wanes, we had a circumstance where um, in the past where we waited too long in August and next thing you know, the pack starts to get a little bit rammy and that's hard to, you know, again, get pups who are new to um, the exhibit um, to feel welcome when you've got um, ramping up uh, hormones um, coming into the fall. So we like that early August timeframe. So as far as visitors, probably we'll have the pups on public display. Again, this depends all on this pandemic and the whole idea of, of protocol of having, you know, more than 10 people in one space. Obviously, uh, we may rely more on our webcams um, in the future, but we we do, uh, will go forward. I, uh, you know, again, I, I, I can't predict the future, but our plan is to go forward with the pups, regardless of whether we're open to the public, I think, because it's important for our pack that we have the cycle of pups coming in. Again, I, I can't, uh, don't quote me on that. I don't have a, any, you know, ability to foresee the future and what happens, but that's kind of our tentative thought right now. Um, so, uh, so hopefully that answers your question. June 5th, public displays four times a day. And then um, by August, uh, pups in with the pack. So uh, there's a question, had the wolves had any anxiety episodes? Wolves, oh, wolves that's the definition of anxiety episodes. Um, you know, wolves are neophobic. Uh, we know from research and from our personal experience, new things make them uh, definitely skittish. We've discovered that we need to do more work with uh, trucks that back up with a beeping sound. Um, Axel and Grayson freak out every time they hear that. And so we're working on trying to figure all these pieces out. So there's a question on how is Denali? Denali is doing great. He is going to be 12 on, on April 27th. He has his own webinar birthday as we honor the memory of Aiden and um, celebrate Denali's birthday. He is, again, the oldest wolf we've ever had living in the pack, um, meaning Typically, our wolves are retired out by the time they're 10. Uh, Danelle is hanging in there. I am a little concerned this morning when I came in. Again, he was in a very um, strong curl rest. I always pay attention to the rest. Um, so they're a little bit chilled this morning. Um, that's my biggest concern is hypothermia. Uh, or no, not so, so much hypothermia. He's got a thick coat. But, you know, the ability to deal with ambient temperatures is problematic when you're older. If you look at um, over in Grizzer's side, you'll notice that we're doing a lot of fence work here with very dark wood. Um, we are using tamarack and cedar, both rot resistant. We choose that dark wood because if you can see on this path line, um, the wood absorbs radiant heat. And on these February, March, even January, um, the sun hits that wood and it warms that area. This is now ice free. Um, I'll do a lot to our, our construction of this dark wood fences. Um, that's what is really helping. And actually in the transition area, there's an area of fence that's open. The sun shines right into his bed. So for these older animals who maybe don't have as good of, of uh, ability to deal with thermal regulatory uh, loss, we do, um, try to construct things that help them. And that's one of the things that we've been really, really spending a lot of time trying to get that done. It'll be beneficial for the pups as well because it'll add extra coverage from the elements, from the rain, um, you know, wind, cold. And the cool thing is we have now also uh, finishing um, an observation area. You can't quite see it here, but this is a windowed hut um, that's going to be insulated uh, with a little floor um, uh, heating mat uh, uh, that um, will allow staff any time of the year to sit outside and observe an animal in decline or observe pups um, in, you know, evening shifts, that kind of thing. It was a challenge when Luna was declining. Uh, we were out in sub-zero weather. Uh, we were out in, um, you know, rainy weather. Um, trying to monitor. And, and again, we have to be mindful of 
our staff. Uh, we want to be out there as best as we can, um, but we, you know, we have to be mindful of, of the challenges of uh, being out in an overnight circumstance. And granted, we have a building where older wolves can go, uh, but um, not all wolves want to be there. Um, so that kind of relates to the question that I had, um, you know, if they have um, uh, a circumstance where we, um, you know, have somebody who wants to um, or has a phobia about being in the building, we're not going to lock them in the building. Um, you know, we're going to let that wolf be where they want to be, where they're comfortable. So hopefully that addresses that question. I have another question. Um, the U.S. facility is providing pups. Are they born yet? No. Uh, typically pups are not born in wolves until uh, late April. Obviously, that just makes sense. If you look at the northern uh, climate, um, you know, it's not logical for subspe or a species to have a, a litter of pups and neonates that are born hairless uh, and vulnerable in this kind of weather. So typically breeding season for wolves in northern Minnesota, including captive wolves, is sometime in beginning of March. There's a 63 gestation period and uh, that would bring them to around the end of April is when the whelping period would occur. Uh, we will not know the gender of what's been born until we uh, uh, get pups, um, but we are seeking a male and a female pup to bring a female back into this exhibit. There's a question, do we ever take in a pregnant wolf? Uh, no, we do not take in adult wolves. Um, we only work with pups. Adult wolves, uh, wolves are very... Uh, protective of the pack, you wouldn't bring an adult wolf into a pack of wolves. Uh, the adult wolves, um, these adult wolves are willingly adopting pups. But one of the reasons why we do the introduction early is even if we allow our pups to get a little bit bigger, let's say over 30 pounds or, you know, a, a big enough where they are perceived as maybe a, a competitor, um, they, they're not willing to accept them. And so, uh, typically, if you want to merge an adult wolf with another adult wolf, you're doing it with pairs, meaning a male wolf meets a, maybe another a female wolf. Uh, uh, but we're not set up for that. Um, there are other facilities that have that accommodation. Um, that is not our mission. Um, that is, uh, again, not how we're set up. We really are um, looking at cohesive social groups, and that's really what we are, are, are trying to feature here. So another question that came in, uh, do uh, I can kill the ravens uh, in captivity? Yes, um, we don't see as much evidence in the wild. I think in captivity, part of the um, cir circumstances are um, that maybe there's just you know maybe I mean we you know obviously captivity there's probably maybe more frustration. I mean I I I guess I don't know what a wolf think. Um, opportunity um, exists uh, maybe uh, from the standpoint that ravens can't get enough lift coming out of fences. Um, I know Grizzer actually several years ago uh, grabbed an eagle that had landed in this pack holding area and these fences are so tight the eagle um, we, we uh, it was a kind of a trying to perch on this back fence line and, and Grizzer had bitten it had, had a broken femur. Uh, we had transferred it down to the Raptor Center and um, was not salvageable uh, uh, the re or not repairable. I mean, so uh, we know that that's a challenge um, for those raptors who do come in and scavenge on food. Um, so that's uh, something that uh, it's not a common occurrence, but I'd say we maybe get three or four that are killed. Um, there's a question, what subspecies do you plan to acquire? And uh, in 2020, our plan is uh, to try to rotate these five subspecies. And we have here, let me introduce the players. And uh, sorry if I'm making you nauseous uh, by my camera movement. Uh, this is Boltz uh, laying down here with his back to us. Boltz is a Minnesota subspecies. He was born in 2012. This is Denali, he is a Northwestern subspecies. Uh, he was born in 2008. This is Axel, he is an Arctic subspecies. He was 2016. So we are rotating, these are three out of the five sub subspecies in North America. We are rotating this Northwestern subspecies, Denali, is our, our preference. That's what uh, we have contact, connected with. Peg Callahan, director at the Wildlife Science Center. Peg provided us Denali and Aden in 2008. Um, tremendous facility from the standpoint of knowledge, from the standpoint of 
of um, vet, uh, vaccinations, veterinary care. Um, you know, we know that the Denali, obviously a tremendous animal, Aiden, tremendous animal, even though it comes to mast cell tumors. Um, um, you know, we, we were, were just were amazing, amazing subspecies to work with. And we are um, so fortunate that we have that ability. And now obviously um, Axel and Grayson came from Canada um, you know, that wouldn't even be an option right now for us um, to be able to transport wolves across the Canadian border. So we're so grateful um, that Peg is willing to work with us again. And uh, that is the subspecies that we are looking to work with. So Elizabeth asked, uh, well, how do the behind the scenes programs work? So let me just share you again um, um, on the behind the scenes programs. And I'm gonna just have to go back to another camera for a second. Um, so the way that the behind the scenes will work um, is we will have a, a fenced area. So the public, well, Tina, Tina wants to leave. Um, so the uh, public will come in this gate and where Tina's lying, we'll have a little half fence that comes across the back of the wolf yard. The pups will be able to come from the exhibit or from the pack holding area, kind of in the back here where my cursor is, they'll be able to come up next to this fence. Hopefully that snow will be gone by June 5th. And uh, you'll be able to see the pups in the yard as they approach the exhibit pack. And by June, most of those ravens should be nesting and not in the, in the exhibit. Uh, there will be a panel of hardware cloth here so the pups cannot get their noses or paws through the fence, but basically, that half fence will probably be about four feet tall so people can stand up and photograph over the fence and uh, be able to see the pups as they hang out in this yard, interact. Uh, hopefully the adults will come down and interact with the, uh, with the pups. And then as part of the behind the scenes, um, this fence line will be extended in front of this door. The public will then be able to walk through this door they'll be able to go past the pup nursery and they'll be able to see um, back through this window uh, they'll be able to see the backyard of the pups pack holding area and then um, we'll be able to also be on the back side and see the east retirement and see grizzers area that's why these little kind of areas are open like this um, so that you behind the scenes people can have visual uh, back to the east side. So that's kind of the plan. Looks a lot of convoluted uh, tunnels. So um, another question, do we have a COVID-19 uh, uh, plan that if you're not able to have pup care staff? Uh, yes, uh, we are very uh, seriously considering, uh, <clears throat> we have 16 wolf care people. We have other people that we can draw on, including the Vermilion um, vet tech instructors. Uh, we have obviously people who live in Ely who are uh, part of our kind of outer uh, uh, you know, group of volunteers. Um, we are developing a plan um, and uh, will realistically look at not having pup care participants, um, but just doing it in-house with pup care staff. And uh, we are clear, clearly um, looking at that um, scenario very closely. So there's a question. Um, uh, how big is the enclosure? Well, these pack um, holding area is uh, is about, it's, it's not very large. It's maybe 75 by 50. Uh, this exhibit is an acre and a quarter. We actually own right up to the back of our property line. So we really don't have anywhere to go with this exhibit pack to make it larger. But uh, one thing we do find with these guys, they kind of hang in the front um, quite a bit. So it's um, the size of the enclosure we find is not necessarily as critical, although obviously I want to be concerned about density and I want to be concerned about um, animals having stress relief. And there's Grayson expressing a little stress right now. Uh, let me find him and see who he's talking to. Uh, I don't know if you heard that howl, that was Grayson. Um, but uh, the nice thing about our exhibit, even though it's only an acre and a quarter, um, we do have very good cover. I spend a lot of time on vegetative management to make sure that our trees are, oh, there's Grace. Make sure that our trees are well taken care of. Um, and make sure that the facility um, also has integrity from the standpoint that the wolves don't have someone behind them. 
That's not Grayson. That's, that's Axel. Right. Grayson must be up in the woods. Anyway, so we have a good hill. Um, that's another thing about this. Our exhibit has a, has a rise in the back um, that allows them um, to go up in the woods and to get cover and to be able to kind of, you know, look out without it being viewed. Um, that's a huge issue for Grayson. Uh, Grayson is probably responding to maybe some wild wolves um, in the back, or I did hear two sled dogs were on the loose, um, got loose up in the wilderness this past week. And um, so there may very well be um, dogs uh, adjacent to the exhibit. Again, their um, response, wolves response, to uh, things coming into the exhibit are threat display. Uh, that's, again, um, the nature of uh, adult wolves coming in would not be viewed as, uh, you know, something they willingly accept. Wolves have a closed door policy. I mean, in, in, in the wild, it has to make sense that, you know, you bond with your pack and you protect your territory. You provide enough food resources for your pack to survive. You don't just have an open door policy, let wolves come and go. I mean, territorial behavior is logical. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's instinctual from the standpoint of survival. So what you're seeing is actually, uh, that's Axel, uh, Grayson went in, that's the medical pen. And what's happening is he's gonna uh, be in this medical pen here. He's probably looking to Tina, um, who again is his, you know, surrogate in his mind. He might even be picking up on a little Tina stress. So we can see the yard and see if anybody pulled in. There's the staff cars, that's just us. But, uh, you know, there could be something that um, triggered that. I'm not really sure. But the, all the cameras are, are designed to be able to kind of keep an eye on that, uh, you know, what's uh, causing them stress around the yard. Yep, that's Grayson. So it was Grayson who was howling. It's interesting. Grayson seems to be the one who picks up on stress and uh, um, responds uh, more than anybody else. So a question, why do you like the work with wolves? Um, I, I, first of all, I, I think it's really important uh, that we have an understanding of this uh, species. You know, I, I love my dog. I love everything about my dog. I love the idea that my dog is a social companion. I like the idea that Grayson cares enough about his pack to let out a bark howl, even though he's not in that position of being in that rank of protecting his pack just yet. Um, I still think there's hope for Grayson to lead this pack someday. The behaviors that I cherish in my dog are the same behaviors these, these wolves possess. And I understand functionality in the wild. And so I think uh, predators and the role of predators is so misunderstood. I think that's really why I choose to work with wolves. Um, you know, the bond that I have with my dog, as well as uh, certainly, um, the fact that the coolest sound on the face of the earth, listening to these guys howl. So uh, that's why I do. Um, and uh, we do not ever release these wolves. Um, the idea, again, once you're born in captivity, first of all, there's no release program for any of these subspecies. The wolf in Canada is a game species. The wolf in the West is a game species. The wolf in Minnesota is still threatened and protected, but has been um, delisted. So it is actually illegal uh, to release these subspecies in the wild because their wild populations are obviously um, in a circumstance where management has been determined uh, for those populations. Second of all, these wolves trust people. We they're born in captivity. We bottle feed them so that they trust us and they trust and they, and they um, are here to help us educate about wolves. We want to make sure that they're relaxed. We want to make sure that they're calm. And, and that's what you're seeing here is wolves that are certainly still neophobic, still afraid of new things, still challenged by people they don't know. That's the nature of the wolf. And that's a great thing. But we take away their fear of people so that they trust us. We would never want that in the wild. We would never want a wolf that t trusts people in the wild. Um, uh, again, there's all types of issues going on in the wild with people habituating wolves by feeding and those habituated wolves um, normally end up in conflict. 
Um, there's a saying, a fed wolf is a dead wolf. And, um, and um, you know, we always want to make sure that, um, you know, that uh, people understand that message. Not saying that they can't survive. Um, you know, we know feral dogs can survive. So that's uh, important to make that distinction. So, uh, a couple of other questions. What ways can the public help financially while you're closed? Obviously, um, there's a lot of ways um, in, in, in financially, obviously, our Wolf Den store is still open online. We have an auction going on right now. We extended it um, until Wednesday because we had a little bit of a challenge uh, with uh, some interpretation of the Endangered Species Act and what products, wolf care products, could be available uh, to the public uh, based on levels of protection of wolves. Um, we ended up having to rescind all of the hair from Arctic uh, Axel and Grayson uh, because the language of the CITES permit of the Endangered Species Act um, had that hair protected. Uh, I'm going to just stop talking here right now because this is a lot more fun to watch than me. I spoke about this on Bolt's birthday webinar. Uh, Bolt has an issue. Uh, we don't know what's going on. His larynx um, for the last, uh, boy, it's been several, uh, I would say probably over a year, maybe even longer. He has no high pitch. Um, it is a challenge to take wolves out for medical reasons. Um, you take a wolf out without the rest of the pack, um, they can um, depose him. They can um, think he's dispersed and um, not accept him back. So um, the vets, um, uh, you know, as best as they could externally, um, you know, uh, believe that he doesn't, that whatever it is is not impacting his ability to swallow, his ability to eat, but there's something going on with his larynx. And uh, we have a protocol. Um, these wolves don't just go to the vet clinic. They don't just sit there and say, you know, I'm, I'm okay with uh, traveling in the car and going to the vet clinic. So it has to be a drugging that has to happen. We have one scheduled for mid-April. The vet clinic is currently closed um, uh, to uh, people. So we're uh, definitely waiting to make sure that we can be safe. And the wolf care staff have to be able to be there with the wolves under, under anesthesia. But basically, Bolts is scheduled for a complete uh, uh, endoscopic exam of his throat to see what's going on. It could be, you know, uh, maybe, uh, you know, in some kind of jaw sparring, some kind of uh, neck pinning that there may have been some damage to his larynx. Um, he had some issues with a bee sting early on, you know, maybe two and a half years ago. It could have been something from that. We don't really know. So we're just waiting um, for that. He's otherwise in, in good health. Um, he's, you know, uh, uh, having no other issues. He's able to consume, you know, well, I shouldn't say no other issues. Axel drives him crazy, but, you know, um, Axel's young and excited. Um, but uh, other than that, um, you know, there's no other physical abnormalities with him. So we're just trying to figure that out. So uh, anyway, so that was um, him not being able to have a high pitch. Uh, he usually has a low pitch, but this was an excited rally howl. Uh, low pitches are typically more defensive. Um, that was just an excitement. So he tried for the upper pitch, which is an excitement rally, and he doesn't have the pitch. Um, so we uh, definitely um, have to be aware of that. So uh, other questions. Do you have potential pup litters lined up, or is it too early in the year? Uh, yes, we already have a, a, a pair selected. Uh, we do that uh, early on um, because we want to know um, who's uh, breeding, we wanted to make sure that we have the record of their health and uh, vaccinations and things. So um, that was selected uh, uh, um, uh, late December, actually early January. So we are good um, to go with uh, pup uh, parents who have a lineage history in uh, British Columbia. And that is the subspecies that we are looking uh, to use. So uh, with that said, um, let me just kind of get to a few other questions here. And so I'm managing, I'm being ambidextrous here. I'm using my left hand for one thing and uh, I just lost all the wolves. So where did they go? Oh, they're there. 
Okay, I'm not left-handed. There we go. Now I'm going to switch back to my real hand. So, um, other questions that we have. How do you know when to move a wolf from the pack in a retirement? Uh, yes, uh, it's challenging to make that call because um, the issue of retirement is not just physical, but it's psychological. So we have to look at tolerances. We make the decision to move a wolf in retirement if they're lower ranking earlier than we do if they're pack leaders. Uh, we need to make sure that that pack leader has mentally um, accepted that change in status because if they haven't, they won't willingly go into retirement uh, without wanting to keep controlling the other, other pack. So it's a process of both psychological and physical. Um, it, it requires the wolf communication to have a really strong understanding of stress. And so um, that's uh, something that we talk about on a regular basis. There's 16 of us in wolf care. We have whiteboards, we have emails, we have um, you know, uh, on, you know, face-to-face -face meetings. Well, at least we did prior to um, um, the new directive from our uh, governor to not, or from our president to more than 10 people together because we have 16 in wolf care. So uh, we, we talk about all those things and uh, make sure that we are all on the same page and what we're witnessing. So um, for us, Denali is the next one to come into retirement. So we're watching Denali. He's wagging his tail. He's right with the pack. Sometimes Axel gets a little excited and jumps on him, but um, he's willingly approach how they approach, how they follow. Those are things that we uh, make sure that they are willing to do. And uh, if that's the case, he gets to stay as long as he can, as long as he wants to. So another question, is the dark wood going to cause issues in the summer? Uh, no. Um, matter of fact, uh, we have trees, we have shade. Um, so the dark, um, yeah, if the sun hits those, uh, obviously dark wood heats up, but um, you know, we have a lot of vegetation. We have a lot of shade. Um, and we do have misting systems. Um, so we uh, are using tamarack and cedar, both are weather uh, proof, or, 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 or not weatherproof, but uh, moisture resistant. And so we can put misting systems right on that wood. Um, but the fact that they cover and create um, areas of no sun um, is a bonus uh, for the wolves. So uh, the trees give us shade. Trees also are wonderful in that they transpire that means that they release moisture every time they open the stomata, um, the cells on their leaves to absorb our carbon dioxide and create oxygen. They release water and that transpiration helps cool the atmosphere. That's why we love trees um, and trees are an important part of our exhibit. So do we have plans for naming the wolves? Will you have a public contest to suggest names? We are in the planning process right now. I believe the plan that we've adopted um, this year. Um, first and foremost, we need to understand that naming of the wolves is very important for us. Um, the wolves have a personality. And, and again, there's a lot of debate in science about you know, cognitive thinking, and, and certainly we're doing our own studies here about wolf uh, recognition of, of who they are, how they interact, that type of thing. But uh, we do believe that a name is something that carries with it more than just a marketing tool. We name our wolves because we associate with them in a social basis. And so for us, that's important for wolf care staff. So I think what we've narrowed down is a plan. And again, this is not definitive, but the wolf care staff are gonna try to pick, um, again, we have, we have male and female. We'll try to pick three names for a male, three, males, three names for a female that fit the personality, that fit the experience that we have of that individual and then we'll put it online um, as soon as we can. You know, we obviously have to spend some time with them and get to know them uh, to be able to come up with something that's creative. Uh, Boltz was named because uh, um, he came to us a little bit older than our typical neonates, and every time a gate was open, he'd run through it. And so we nicknamed him Boltz because, you know, the protocol was close the gate or, or Boltz is gonna bolt out the door. <laughs> that was his personality that fit to us. Now, someone outside of the organization might not come to that conclusion. And so, you know, we thought um, it, it, it is helpful to us if we provide the names. We still want the public to be involved. We certainly want the public to um, weigh in on it. So what we'll probably do is have a voting for people to uh, make that um, happen. And so that's kind of how we're gonna run. 
Wolz will still get a little issues about things over his head. Um, if he joined us for his birthday webinar, we talked about his neophobia uh, insects, but ravens also kind of make him a little bit uneven, un, 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 uh, un uh, what's the phrase I'm looking for, uh, unnerved. Ears pricked and turned sideways. That's, a, that's an indication he's interested, but a little uncomfortable. And maybe it's because my camera gives a little bit of a motor buzzing every time I turn it. So that makes him uncomfortable as well. Katie asked, do we read stories to the wolves? Uh, last time I tried to bring a piece of paper in there, it ended up in the scat bucket. So I don't bring any books in, but we talk. I mean, we are social creatures. The wolf care staff, we may not seem like it because we, you know, are... Um, maybe all socially awkward um, that we prefer to hang out with wolves in a scat bucket, but we chatter. I mean, my gosh, I don't know if the cameras, the mics are, might be on when I come in, but I'm always yammering to somebody. I was always talking to somebody. Um, that's who we are. You know, they're used to us. Um, I think they're more nervous if we don't say anything, you know, they're used to being expressive. They communicate all the time. They're whining They're, you know, um, their ears are going, you know, 100 miles a minute, you know, communicating, expressing, they're saying things with their body language, they're saying things visually with their eye contact. Um, you know, we have to be part of that communication. And so we are uh, very, very animated. So uh, the question is, if you do not receive a female top to create a dominant pair, will the pack continue to, lay, to lack any dominance? Um, uh, yes, I think they're, the pack is going to... Um, uh, you know, there are uh, wolves who are more dominant, obviously, personality trait. Denali, I think everybody refers to him because he's the old man in here. And uh, even though he doesn't push it very much, I think there's some reverence to him as being more dominant. Axel um, Git is a search more dominant. So there's going to be that kind of posturing. But I don't think we'll have a really, what I consider to be a real complete, you know, uh, pack like we had with Shadow and Maya or we had even to some extent with Luna and and Aiden, I'm um, having a, a pack leadership. So uh, again, likelihood of a pup being born, we hope, uh, you know, we obviously have to make those decisions and we obviously want to look at the health of the pups when they're born too. So those things are up in the air. As with any pup plan, we have, you know, we have desirable protocol and then we work with the facility to make sure, um, you know, we, we do what we can uh, to, to whatever is best for the animals. So. Daylight savings time has already started. If so, a start time is wrong. Um, so sorry about that. Um, I, um, I believe that the webinar uh, link showed uh, nine o'clock central daylight time. And so I apologize if that was wrong. I know Zoom's been having a little bit of challenges for some things in the last couple of uh, weeks. Uh, so uh, we'll double check on that to make sure that um, that is uh, mine or uh, reference. So what about Grayson being so sensitive to people in the yard? Uh, yeah, we um, have no control over that. Right now, as a matter of fact, um, Tina is barking at something and you can see the response in the wolves. Tina's their, um, you know, Tina's their surrogate. If Tina says something stressed, then they need to know what that is. And so Tina, um, her barking can cause them a little bit of anxiety. So there's my dog with her lack of training to listen to other staff, Tina. <laughs> so I think she was just barking because she's cold. She's 15 as well. So she's kind of moving kind of slow. Plus, like I say, this lab is like torturous for her. So let me um, call my dog in. Tina, sweetie. Come on, girl. Good girl. Come on, pup. So yeah, so that's something that we have to work on with Grace, Grace and I don't know how we, you know, at this stage, we're not going to be able to get over that, uh, but we're definitely going to be mindful of uh, um, controlling dogs barking because the dog that is bonded to them, uh, barking is a form of of an alarm, and so when they're bonded to a dog and that dog barks, it's going to be viewed as a threat. Um, and so when we choose a surrogate with the pups, we have to make sure it's a dog that doesn't bark repetitively. So that's kind of a challenge uh, for us. So we will keep working on that. Um, Grayson for us, and there's a yawn. So that yawn, again, that's part of the stress dictionary. Um, yawning doesn't mean they're tired. Um, yawning means there's a little anxiety going on there. Tina barked, they're not certain why she barked, cause a little anxiety in Axel. Axel actually is quite more anxious than Grayson. Um, he just doesn't show it as much. Uh, 
his anxiety um, usually manifests itself into excitement. And so uh, I, uh, um, whereas Grayson um, shows it as uh, true anxiety, bark howling, um, ears drop down low, head drop down low, that type of thing. So we have another question. Do smaller animals like squirrels enter the wolf habitat? If so, do the wolves hunt them? Yes. Uh, we have been here on site since 1989. I say in most of the genetically um, uh, less aware uh, red squirrels um, have been removed from the population um, over that time. Um, the red squirrels that we have here now are very creative. As a matter of fact, they'll sit up in the tree, drop pine cones on the heads of the wolves and somehow um, get away from them. So I do not see a lot of squirrel kills here like I did in the old days. Although we are getting, uh, with climate being a little bit different, we are getting some Franklin ground squirrels who uh, have been in the um, exhibit. Uh, those are relatively slow, not uh, a real northern species uh, that uh, could very well be the next uh, uh, squirrel to enter the enclosure uh, with a limited chance of getting out. We probably have, um, more issues with snowshoe hair uh, coming in, especially into retirement. They don't seem to care that they're hopping around the exhibit of retired animals. Um, yet uh, Luna had her fair share of a kill. I'll talk about that in Luna's webinar. Um, she was on a diet, yet we could not restrict the number of snowshoe hair that she consumed. Um, that was a challenge for her. So. Other questions here, do we, uh, how do we choose the names? I think I kind of addressed that. Um, the wolf care staff will pick them based on personality. Then we'll put them on the website uh, for a couple of weeks for people to vote on them and then announce them probably kind of into late June. How do you determine what subspecies raise in captivity? Well, our protocol has been because um, we want to try to educate. Our job here is education. We are not a breeding facility. And so we try to manage three out of the five subspecies in North America. That's the Northwestern of Dedale, the Arctic of Axel Grayson, and, and the Minnesota subspecies of Bolt. And to do that, obviously we'd never breed them because those three subspecies would not meet in the wild. And so we wouldn't want to reproduce something that wouldn't occur. Plus this is only an acre and a quarter exhibit. We don't want to have, you know, uh, wolves every year and then have to give them away um, because we, you know, don't have a place for them. Uh, captive born, captive stay is where they are unless they're critically endangered like Mexican or red wolves. So we chose in 1989 to be a non-breeding facility. We neuter and spay everything we have here. We will not reproduce. Um, we only adopt pups. We integrate them into the adults. And so that management decision has been something that we've done since really, we've been here since 89. We've been introducing pups since the year 2000. And um, that's been on a four year cycle. And uh, that's kind of how we manage. So at this point, um, we just are rotating the cycle. Denali and uh, Aiden were uh, Northwestern subspecies and that's the cycle. That's where we're up next. We just did the Arctics in the last cycle. And then, so after that, 2024, it would be again, Minnesota subspecies. So that's how we make the rotation. How do we make the enclosure uh, like their natural habitat? Um, well, I have a forestry, a master's degree in forestry. So I work very hard at identifying diseases at removing things that are, um, you know, uh, challenging that um, thinning the forest so that it has sunlight to be able to regenerate trees. I do planting, I do seeding. The wolves do a fair amount of uh, unplanting. I have planted um, more trees than I can count. Wolves have pulled up more trees than I can count. Um, but I'm diligent. I am committed to making the vegetation, um, you know, as um, quality as possible. So you'll see us do pruning. You'll see, you know, um, in the spring, uh, normally the Vermilion Community College fire class would come in and help us do some uh, health assessment and removal. Unfortunately, they are now online uh, for the rest of the term. So I'm not sure how I virtually uh, cut trees um, yet. We're working on that, but uh, um, we will continue to do uh, vegetative management equally as much as we do wolf management here as part of uh, the wolf care process. So um, question is, do I think Grayson will step up a pack leader when the pups come in? I think um, the reality is whichever wolf seems to have the strongest bond with that female, um, they're going to get the reinforcement of that female to take leadership. I think Denali 
He's had opportunities to take leadership. He's not wanted it. Uh, Denali Hill will have his birthday webinar on April 27th. I'll show you some footage where Denali tried to be a leader. He wasn't very good at it. He didn't want it. Aiden took it. Um, and the reality is Aiden um, uh, became the PAC leader, I think, because he had uh, probably support. At first, it didn't look like it, but he had support from Maya. Denali's doing a little demonstration of uh, time to get the wolf care staff in there with a rake. He wants a bed. He wants to lay in the sun. It's a little cold. Um, doesn't want to lay in the snow. Um, in the wild, obviously, wolves lay in the snow all the time. But in the wild, wolves don't have compacted snow like this. They have fresh snow. They can get insulation. Captive wolves don't. So we give them cover hay. And normally by now, I would have been in the pen raking for them. So he's still a little bit of curl rest. That tells me that older animals, ambient temperature, he's probably a little bit um, not hypothermic, but he's definitely um, a little bit colder and uh, wants a little bit of comfort. So I'll be getting in there shortly. I did uh, want to mention that you uh, will see our low webcams. They're on all the time. You will see wolf care staff in, in the enclosure. Sometimes wolf care staff are, you know, uh, doing body work or managing, um, you know, doing um, that kind of thing. It's uh, definitely, uh, you know, a challenge that we have. We obviously want people to respect the fact that we have trained professionals doing wolf care. We certainly don't want people to say, oh, look, they're just like a dog. Let me get one and then um, have a wolf that's not understood. So it's definitely kind of a challenge for us to have you uh, watch us on camera. Sometimes we forget there's a camera. Sometimes we forget there's a mic. So I apologize in advance. Uh, but, um, you know, we have to give the wolves the care they need. Um, we have to socialize with these wolves. That's how we get them to trust us when we do veterinary care, when we inject them, when we have to drug them, um, when we have to check their teeth, when we want to check their throat, if they've got something going on like bulls does. Um, so I want to make sure people understand uh, that's uh, part of our process. Um, um, so I guess I, I want to leave it at that. And then I want to make sure, too, here's a perfect example Notice the way Bolts is lying compared to the way Denali is lying. Bolts is doing a side rest. Um, and so one of the things that we're doing is right now we're working on this pup ethogram, a behavioral book where people can um, record data. They get some kind of sense of what some of the behaviors are and help record data. And uh, they can actually use this little pamphlet to record our pups, whether it be on camera or whether it be coming to the visitor center, that kind of thing. We're working on that as, a, as what's called a wolf care initiative uh, to uh, be able to uh, help support the wolves uh, by, by having these products that are specific to wolves uh, to the wolf care department. And so that's something that we're kind of working on. So that tells me just by looking at that. So in our ethogram, we have a, a rest. We have a side rest. Bolts is comfortable with the temperatures. He's laying on his side. He's not curling up and protecting the area under his belly that has less hair. He's laying on his side. He's a little probably concerned about my camera noise but he's not cold. He's laying right on the ice. Denali is. This is probably an age-related thing more than anything. And uh, so the webinar I'm producing, sorry, the YouTube I'm producing for the public later today, I actually have some video. Um, Boltz has got a really uh, massive amount of hair on his foot. He looks like a ptarmigan. Um, and uh, he has the ability to... Uh, uh, keep warm, whereas uh, Denali's not so much. So that's really uh, kind of speaks to what wolf care is about. We're about watching every circumstance. I know a lot of people say, well, those wolves are just laying down. It's more than that. Um, it's more than just lying down. Um, there's something to be said about how they're lying, where they're lying, who's touching who. Right now, this is a standover. That's a passive a uh, form of dominance that Axel's doing. He's walking slow. He's kind of doing a deliberate step. He is, again, back to this whole idea of Axel, trying to get a little power, trying to get a little dominance. And um, Denali pricked his ears and turned sideways. And I'm, I'm alert to it, but I'm not going to engage in it. Um, these are all important things that we watch, and that's what trained wolf care does. So... Um, uh, so a couple of questions. Um, Tony uh, has a question about uh, how do gray wolves and spotted hyenas are similar? Uh, they're both predators and scavengers. Uh, well, I think gray wolves initially are predators first, uh, meaning that uh, 
a lot of their behavior, and we talk about this a lot, the behavior of gray wolves is driven by predatory behavior. And the fact that the social dynamics of gray wolves, even differing from coyotes, seems to be conducive to animals living in a social group, working cooperatively, strategically hunting, um, meaning that it's more than just, um, we're gonna have four of us run after an elk and we hope we catch it. There's communication that goes on about how they structure a kill. And so I think that's probably one of the differences and I'll leave it at that. And I can maybe do some research and um, give you a little bit more information about the different types of hunting strategies. Um, as a matter of fact, I think Dave Leach um, co-authored a book on hunting strategies across the, uh, the, the Canid uh, family. And so I'll look into it more. I apologize, Dave, if you're watching, I haven't read the book, I'm a little busy. Um, so uh, I'll try to share that with you. Uh, Amy asked, why don't the other wolves join in the howl? It seems in the wild, I hear the whole pack howl. Again, um, that depends upon the circumstances. Uh, um, the howl for Grayson, if it's a warning howl, um, it, it, the whole pack may not respond. I have wolves that are in the, my backyard. Um, when it is a, a threatened howl, I hear a lone howl all the time. Um, when we're around um, a circumstance where maybe it's humans, uh, it's maybe the dominant pair that's making a threat response uh, around the pups, um, then the pack um, may be restrictive to just the dominance expressing a threat display. Pack rallies, social howls, yeah, the whole group. Uh, this past week, we had a pack that came through my backyard. I think the first of howls I heard was a dominance, and then I heard a coyote yelp, um, and then I heard the whole pack um, go off. So I think the dominance confronted the coyote is my interpretation from what I heard. So it was only a pair of wolves I heard. I heard the coyote. Um, in a high-pitched squeal threat display, and then the coyote took off, and then I heard the pack get together in a pack rally. So I, it, 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 who howls, when they howl, a uh, whole pack howling um, is really, I think, dependent upon um, the circumstance. Uh, Fred Harrington did some great work here in the Superior National Forest uh, in the 70s with the Jack Pine Mountain Pack. Um, and actually identified circumstances when, when individual wolves howled. And certainly, obviously, a lot of researchers have done that since then. So um, I, um, that's what I, that my take on it um, about howling. And uh, again, until they talk and tell me, no, you're all wet, that's wrong. Um, I'm just gonna leave it at that. So um, a couple of other questions. Um, so the question, um, there's some auction question, um, uh, and, I, and I will probably answer that directly. Uh, so our, we had a wolf care auction, and we had um, communicated with the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, Permit um, Division, um, the head of the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, Permit Division in uh, the state of Virginia when we first started kind of the use of this shed coat. So in other words, when the wolves shed their hair in the spring, we were crushing it, we were saving it for years, we just threw it away. Then, um, you know, we talked to the Fish and Wildlife Service and said, you know, we use this. Um, the permitting office gave us some information, some language that said, yes, we could use this. And then, um, so we, we did, we made some products, we put it in an auction this year, and then um, we, um, came, we discussed, uh, actually it came to our attention through a Facebook post, uh, one of the local St. Paul uh, Fish and Wildlife Service agents said, you know, you need to clarify that, that's not accurate information. We went back to him, got the accurate information, um, found the clause of the uh, Endangered Species Act that dealt with Minnesota wolves and now have a better clear idea of what's author, what's available as a product. Captive born or wild, they are still protected under the Endangered Species Act. The Minnesota clause uh, for wolves born in Minnesota, which is Denali, Bolts, Grizzer, Aiden, Luna, is that product from those wolves, such as the undercoat hair, could be sold, but could only be sold to Minnesota residents. So to answer your question, Elizabeth, you can't be from out of state and come here and pick it up. That is not what the law, that's not how the law reads. You have to be a Minnesota resident and, and that's the law. And, and, and the one thing you should know about me, if you do not know me personally, is that my ethics and my integrity is 
what uh, as far as I'm concerned, all I have in life. Um, I will always obey the law. Um, and that is a very important thing for me. Um, I apologize profusely for not interpreting the law correctly the first time in getting the permission. Uh, we've now, uh, again, understand it. Um, so that is the law. Minnesota residents are allowed to bid on product from Minnesota born wolves in captivity. That will not change unless Minnesota wolves are delisted in the wild and no longer threatened. Um, obviously, there's a political move for that to happen. Obviously, that's independent. You know, at this point, that's what we are, where we're at. The case with Axel and Grayson is different. Axel and Grayson were imported from Canada under the Convention for the International Trade of Endangered Species. Their import permit was not for commercial. Their import permit was educational only. So no commercial product is allowed from an import CITES permit that is not listed as commercial. And so their hair has to be discarded. Um, and that will not change in their lifetime because that um, the way that they were imported into our country, um, that is a stand, that's the permit. And so uh, we will still brush them because brushing them um, helps us look for ectoparasites. It gets uh, rid of that summer coat, um, but we will discard it as, uh, per the law. And so that's the way it is understood to me. That's the issue. And we will um, um, have that uh, uh, as our protocol. Obviously, the 2020 pups will be Minnesota born. And um, so uh, they will be allowed to have product made to be sold only to Minnesota residents. So if that isn't a ringing endorsement to move to Minnesota, I don't know what is. So um, as far as Bolts' tuck tail, Yes, Bolt has a confidence level that is near zero. Um, we work with it. Uh, he is uh, worried about uh, being vulnerable during the howling because here's the, my take on it. And again, I don't know until the wolves talk to me if this is right or not. But we know that howling in the wild means that pack members are going to get back together. If you watch the Ellesmere Island clip that Jim Brandenburg and Dave Meech did in the um, late in the mid 80s and 87, I think that was produced by National Geographic. When the pack was separated and they howled, they always seemed to get together and always tried to reinforce warmth because you've been separated. So in other words, if you were possibly out hunting on your own and you were injured and you got back together you know, they're going to check and they're going to see, are you still number three? You know, you left here number three, I'm number four, are you still number three? That's the theory anyways about rallying, getting wolves back together and that there's some uh, period of time of reasserting rank. Here in captivity, it's crazy because they're all in the same enclosure, yet after a howl, they all seem like they have to reassert, yep, I'm still in charge, even though I'm 20 feet away from you and I'm still in the same place in the hierarchy. And so in this pack hierarchy, I think right now we have Denali by default just because he's the old guy and these young ones are only three. Um, they will be four on May 2nd, Axel and Grayson. You know, they still have this, I mean, wolves are wolves. I mean, they still, they're social and they have a bond with Denali when you know, um, he came in, Grayson less than Axel, but you know, there's still that kind of, I'm looking to you for some leadership. You know, we all do in times of crisis. Um, we look to, to people in authority, to wolves in, in kind of, you were in a leadership role when I was a pup and I was anxious and now I'm looking to you. That's the nature of social beings. And so I think that's the hierarchy. Then it's Axel, then it's Grayson, and then it's Bolts. And that's kind of um, what I see for the hierarchy right now. Um, Deb asked, did they grieve Maya's passing? Uh, yes, I, I, I will probably try to include that in Aiden's uh, webinar on April 27th. But after Maya died, the deep-throated howling that Aiden did um, after Maya's death was just tremendous. Um, it, it clearly um, impacts the pack and to the point where our, our veterinarian is very, very holistic in this idea of how we manage our wolves. When we have a wolf pass, we show the body to his pack mates or her pack mates. We did that with Aiden. Um, and uh, 
um, with Luna. And I will share that again with uh, Aiden's uh, webinar um, to get more detail on that. So there's a question, can females in a pack or is always a male? Uh, yeah, certainly I think if you go back to Yellowstone to give an idea of, you know, there's a lot of time now, you can search YouTube. Um, look at the Iron Maiden of the Druid pack. Um, you know, certainly the belief is that a dominant pair, and actually that's kind of the natural pack in the wild, a dominant pair have their offspring, and those offspring either bide their time, stick out with their parents, or they disperse, and they form a pack. And so um, that's why Dave Meech, uh, uh, founder of the Wolf Center here and uh, lead biologist for the USGS project, and certainly a biologist uh, 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 that's consulted on many, many projects, changed the language from alpha to dominant pair. The old thoughts was that you were in charge because you were dominant, you were harassing everybody else. As they studied wolves more and got more intimate view of wolves by looking at things like Ellesmere, where you could watch the wolves, they created a broader understanding that, you know, this isn't about rank. This isn't about pushing each other around. This is about pair bonding. This is about parents. This is about family social groups. And so I think that's a really important, um, um, you know, kind of component of uh, the social nature of wolves. And so I think that's, you know, that's important to recognize. Uh, there's a question these days, are you doing anything extra during wolf care to check wolves for fever, respiratory issues that might be virus related? First of all, let me just say that COVID-19 uh, is not the same as canine coronavirus. Um, canine coronavirus is a canine virus. Uh, our wolves are vaccinated for it. Uh, the, um, you know, the risk of, I mean, they can obviously uh, come down with things. Obviously, any older wolves were obviously cognitive of that. You know, Grizzer um, having a cold, you know, or, or just having an ambient uh, temperature issue in this cold weather because I'm sorry, but it's March, but it's still 10 degrees here. Um, you know, those are, those are things that we watch for. Uh, but we are not, you know, we're following CDC guidelines as well as other veterinary recommendations, you know, to, you know, monitor things. And I can quick share with you the things that we do deal with. Um, this is uh, something I'm working on right now um, is a wolf pup health issues. These are the things that we worry about for pups. Um, obviously fecal, um, because we do worry about coronavirus. We do uh, canine coronavirus. We do worry about probably more than anything parvo. We worry about coccidia, parasites and that type of thing um, before pups are vaccinated. But one good thing about working with the Wildlife Science Center, Peg Callahan, is that we know uh, out of all the people I have worked with over the 34 years that I've done wolf care, I trust the Science Center will always, always do what's medically right. And I know that the health of the parents is not gonna be an issue with me. So those parents will carry antibodies into our pups. And so really that's the less of my concern. Um, I worry about things like aspiration, choking, um, parasites, you know, limping, tail injuries, you know, torn toenails, um, beehives, eye injuries, burns and scalding I shouldn't be worried about. But, you know, um, obviously uh, when we're in a circumstance, um, you know, uh, where you're around things, um, you know, that are human, you always have to be aware of that. But basically, um, I want to thank Alwyn Bream, one of our uh, wolf care staff he put this together for uh, all the wolf care staff um this goes into everything about the types of stools we have how do we collect fecal samples you know what's aspiration because these pups will be bottle fed how do we know when a pup is choking um what are the parasites like i said parvo um is a is a risk to us whoa uh, parvo is a risk to us um you know we um uh, also go into the incubation periods seven to 14 days for parvo. Uh, surface life of parvo is two years. Um, that's huge for us. So we have disinfectants before the uh, pups come, we're gonna be bleach in this place. Uh, gallon of bleach, a one to 32 solution. You know, these are the kind of things that we deal with for pups. We know the window of susceptibility. So um, to answer your question, probably the longest answer of, of the question uh, was um, yes, um, we are watching things, um, but we are not as concerned about our adult wolves as we are with our pups. So um, uh, I'll kind of wrap this up. I know people will probably have other things to do or maybe not. Um, I know I've got other things to do. I, I have wolves who need bedding. Um, 
these days, uh, oh, I answered that one, uh, was uh, that Axel doing a raised leg urination? Uh, yes, that was Axel. Um, and the question is, do the behavior follow a period of stress or anxiety? Um, and um, uh, that would not usually stress or anxiety, but because Tina barked, um, maybe there was something that they needed to mark uh, their behavior. Their behavior of marking is usually directed to other pack members or maybe it's just to reinforce their status, that type of thing. And then the other question is, what was Denali digging for? Denali was making a bet. Uh, Denali was reminding me to get in there and give him some cover hay because it's 10 degrees and he's going on 12. So uh, that's what Denali was telling me. So what kind of educational background is a good one for wolf care professionals? Um, so we, um, I look for people that have some knowledge of, to me, um, you need to understand the ecology of the wolf in the wild to be able to understand the behaviors that have evolved in captivity. So I always want to know somebody who has an understanding of wildlife management. I want to know the understanding of dogs because I think People who intimately work with dogs, live with dogs, I think have a better understanding. So I'm always gonna look for people who are dog owners, who have been around dogs. I'm always gonna look for people who are situationally aware. I don't have any idea how to train that. I just know the people who say, you know what? I noticed this limp or I noticed this uh, gate um, isn't closing. I noticed that you know, this wolf didn't eat this. I noticed that this wolf's ears were different. That's the kind of people I want in this wolf care staff. I want them to always, always look for the differences and that's really what I'm looking for. So I'd say those two things, obviously a vet tech degree is helpful, but I um, probably more importantly am looking at like a wildlife management degree. Our minimum qualifications are a two year degree. Um, I teach at the College here at Vermillion. We have a natural resource technology degree. Um, as I said earlier, forestry, Vegetative management is key, I think, to wolf management in the wild as well as wolf management in captivity. So I really look for NRT students um, to really kind of help us out. So let me kind of wrap up. I know I talked too long here, but uh, there's another question. Since COVID-19 protocols are keeping regular habitat maintenance, do you anticipate the need for working for wolves crew later this year? Um, we have a tentative one scheduled, but obviously if we do not have more than 10 allowed on site, we will have to cancel that event. Um, so we are, I've sent out emails to people who are already uh, registered for that program. Um, and uh, we will be communicating that. We'll give people uh, advance notice as much as we can. So we, when I do next week's advance, can you talk about the differences between coyotes and wolves next week? Yes, uh, please, uh, Kelly, could you write that down? Because um, I, um, I have senior moments myself. I, in canine years, let's see, seven, I'm 120. <laughs> so uh, I, um, I need to have people write that down. So I will, I will clearly um, uh, address that. But you can always email me questions, curator at wolf.org um, before this event next week and I can um, answer things. I also have a webinar for Luna next Wednesday. So if you wanna um, come in um, and join us for that as well, um, that would be helpful. So. So thank you guys for joining us. Um, um, and uh, we will address uh, uh, other information. Elizabeth, I have another, um, yes, I see your other email. I'll talk to you about that directly. Uh, so thank you. Um, and again, for a future um, webinar, or for future uh, uh, sessions, webinars are, again, are scheduled. Those are a revenue generator to help support the Wolf Care Program. Um, if you want to help support us, products, uh, the auction, we extended it till Wednesday at 10 a.m. That's when we finish wolf care and we'll start processing things at that time. Um, so if you want to support us, we have a lot of auction items. Please, if you are bidding on wolf hair, please respect the law. And um, our policy um, is only Minnesota residents. We will uh, be checking that um, to make sure we're adhering to that legislation um, before products go out the door. So thank you for joining us. And um, like I said, you'll be watching us do wolf care here momentarily. Um, and uh, we'll be putting out a little more cover hay. Uh, and uh, these guys are doing great. So that's the pack update. And I want to put uh, you know,
know, certainly, please, please stay healthy. And, uh, you know, this uh, time is unprecedented for us all. So obviously you've heard that phrase over and over again. You know, any way that we can help you relieve the stress, you know, there's nothing like watching these guys um, to make you just think about um, the wonderful work that's being done on behalf of wolves by many, many, many organizations. Uh, again, the Wildlife Science Center is another key player. Uh, they're, um, you know, they're struggling as well. So if you have a chance um, to give a shout out to those folks, um, you know, we are always, always uh, supportive of all the organizations that work with us to make wolf education important in this world. So thanks for joining us and uh, see you next Friday.